An entomologist and indeed studies insects. So they spend time in the field. So they could be out in the wilderness, like I'm showing right here. Actually, I did this in my drawing too. I drew them in the field. They explore in the world to find and study insects in their natural homes. They can collect and examine insects in their lab. So here's someone working in a lab looking at the behavior of an insect. And they can use tools like microscopes, like here, in order to learn about their behavior. They study samples from the past hundreds of years because people have been collecting insects for hundreds of years and they last a really long time. I have an insect here from when I was your age. For 20 years ago, I got this swallowtail. It's a real insect. It's lasted this whole time and it's still beautiful. And we'll learn about that more today of why this insect is still so beautiful years and years later. They study these insects in giant collections that are like libraries of insects. So I drew a kind of library here with this insects in a drawer. So entomologists can work in the field, they can work in a lab, they can work in these giant libraries full of insects, and they do all that in order to study insects. So really good guesses, everyone. So studying insects is really, really important because it helps us understand our world. Insects are really important. They're really important for pollinating flowers. Right here you see a moth, and it looks almost like a hummingbird, doesn't it? But it's a moth, and it's pollinating this flower. So without insects, we wouldn't be able to pollinate flowers. Without that, we wouldn't have fruits and vegetables. Without fruits and vegetables, we'd have nothing to eat. Now you can see how important they are. They're also a really important food source. Lots and lots of animals eat insects. And they're also really important for decomposing. All right, so we have a couple videos to show you, two videos of, of different entomologists working in kind of different environments. Because I said they work kind of in different environments. So here's the first one of one of those libraries full of insects. Oh yeah, this is interesting. When, when we get some insects in, they're just dead. Of course, we have to mount them, so we have to pin them or point, point them, and then we label them. Ah. The glue was not stiff enough and he's fallen off his point. Then after I do that, then I sort him to genus. Uh, each of these units, uh, trays, holds 55 specimens on average. And we have at least a million weevils and a quarter of a million plant hoppers. I liked the video. You liked the video, me too. Wasn't it fun? And it showed how passionate they were about these insects. Really cool, huh? And imagine being able to go into one of these collections and see all these insects that are so bright and beautiful and different shapes and sizes. Okay, let's move on to the next video because I'm sure you'll have a couple questions about this one too. Here's an example of an entomologist working in the field. What I do is I go out into the wild, into areas where people have not gone before. And I try to find really cool, weird, old bugs. To me, an entomologist was like that guy that just works in a museum and doesn't do anything but just look at dead bugs, right? And then I started finding out about field work. So once I started seeing that you can actually not only discover new species, but you can find information that no one else has just by seeing how the insects live, you start being fascinated and knowing that no one's there to do that and you're the only one makes it magical. <laughs> Right, so there was an entomologist working in the field. Does anyone have any questions or comments about that? When they were um, going through the field, when he was going through the field and looking for bugs, and there were different bugs, and one of them looked like a cactus and then it turned into a caterpillar. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty wild. And we're actually going to learn about that, what we saw going on on Thursday. We're going to learn how this insect looked like it transformed right before our very eyes. That was a really good observation. Great job as a scientist to observe that. I think Miss Marfine Valencia has a question for you all. What is an insect? We've been talking about them, but what are they? Hi everybody, does anyone know what is an insect? Like mosquitoes are insects and butterflies. 
Yeah. Turtles and butterflies are insects. It's a great idea. Both of you guys are piecing things together so well. <laughs> Wonder kids are just geniuses. Mr. Ling and I struggled so hard figuring out an insect. Mr. Ling was teaching me about insects the other day. <laughs> Let's see. Sebastian, do you have any idea what could be an insect by chance? Yes. An insect could be a grasshopper or a ladybug. An insect could be anything that has three legs on each side. That's a wonderful point. Yeah, and we're going to talk more about those legs. So a lot of insects, they seem to have something in common. Now let's discuss more of what makes an insect an insect. So insects are just like animals. Imagine like a dog, a cat, an elephant, a well, even us. We're animals too. So they're actually the most common type of animal. There are more than one million species of insects that have been documented. So we're not counting the ones we haven't discovered yet. The total number of all the ones we found so far, including animals, is about 2.5 million. Imagine 2.5 million of these insects going around. So these insects, they're about 40% of all living things. Keep in mind, wow. these are just the ones that we found so far. So there's still a lot of them hidden among there. Wow, that is so cool, Miss Morphine Valencia. So almost half of all animals are insects. That is so interesting. So insects come in all different sorts of shapes and sizes. Here's a giant walking stick insect right here. They're from buzzing bees to colorful butterflies and industrious ants. Some of you listed some of those examples yourselves. They play really important roles in nature. They help flowers grow by spreading pollen and they break down dead plants with our word decomposition. But let's learn some more about other parts of an insect. Do you know by chance what part of an insect is at its front, has its eyes and its mouth? It's the head. Yeah, the head. Great job. Yep, the head is the part of the insect we're going to talk about first. It has two antennas. So imagine a TV antenna. You adjust to get the signal. Those are the antennas on top of the insect's head. Next, we have composite eyes. It has two composite eyes. Composite means that each eye is made up of a lot of tiny little eyes. There's a million of little eyes looking right at you. And then it has a mouth with specific mouthpieces for their life cycle, like biting, cutting, piercing, and sucking. Now, do you know an insect with a piercing slash sucking mouth part? It's an insect that pierced through you. Oh, do you know? A mosquito? Yeah, a mosquito. Great job. Yeah, mosquitoes love to pee piece through you with their mouthpiece to take off the nutrients from your blood so they can live. Now, let's go on to a next part of an insect. All right, the next part is the thorax. So you can remember this by thinking about Thor's, instead of a Thor's hammer, Thor's axe. So here's the thorax. It's the middle section of the insect. Uh, so the thorax is really important because it's where the legs connect. And all insects, like we've talked about, have six legs. This one's cut in half, so we only see one, you know, one half bit. We can't see the back side. But it has three here, it has three on the other side. Also, all insects that have wings have four wings. So if it has wings, that's where the four wings connect. No insect's going to have two wings or, or six. It's always going to have four wings if it has them at all. So here's my moth again right here. You can see it has these two bigger wings in the front that are kind of striped, and then it has these two pink wings in the back. So it has four wings. If we go back to the, the um, stick insect with the wings earlier, it had four wings. It had four of those red, weird-looking things. And we're going to find out that different insects use these things for different purposes. Like this uh, uh, moth is using its wings to fly. That stick insect is using its wings as a display to show off. Um, a fly will have two big wings, and then it'll have two tiny wings that it uses just to measure like air pressure and the direction of air like a helicopter does. And so they can use these same body parts 
again and again in lots of different ways. And that's how we get these different shapes and sizes. But for an insect, you see the abdomen's at the very end. And I actually just saw a butterfly yesterday ovipositing, the fancy word for insects laying eggs, ovipositing eggs on the, on the leaves outside of my, um, my place here. And it was had this area, its abdomen bent over, and it was carefully placing eggs in very specific locations. It was ovipositing eggs. And we're going to pull out our insect from it. Everybody has a different bug. I mean, different insects. Everyone has all different insects. All right, right. guys. So we're going to get started now that everybody has their bug and that little ant. We're going to start by pointing at the head of the ant, the, well, the insects. Everybody look at your insects and you're like, mm, where could the head be? For example, mine will be right here at the top because I can see the mouth. Does everybody know where their insect's head is at? Let's see. The great clue Let's is see. the antennae and the mouth. Maybe now the antenna there's also like these mouth pieces attached to it. Now Good the job. next question the next question is gonna be where is the thorax? So the thorax lines with Lorax, so <laughs> it helps me remember. <laughs> where is so, the thorax of the mouth? So to help you out, you can flip it upside down and see where the legs connect. Remember that the legs come out of the thorax. So my legs connect right here, so the thorax oh, will probably be right here. It's a ladybug. Oh, yeah. That is a good question, Mr. Land. Where would the thorax be on a ladybug? The same thing. Yeah, great question. So it looks a little different, but same thing. Right where the legs come out of the thorax. It's going to have a really tiny abdomen. So if you flip it upside down, you're going to see where the legs come out on the ladybug, and it'll still have a thorax. The last part is, where is the abdomen? So we're going to look at our insect, and we're going to point where the abdomen is. Okay, for me, the admin is the butt. Yep. <laughs> yep, so like okay. for the ladybug, too, it's just going to be the very end of it. It's going to be the abdomen. All right, All guys, right. you did amazing. Let's move on to the next activity. And you guys can keep the bugs. Take good care of them. So bugs are actually a type of insect. And Giovanna has a bug. Giovanna's insect is a bug. So not all bugs, all not all insects are bugs, but all bugs are insects. Here's a bunch of different insects that aren't bugs. You know, grasshoppers aren't bugs, flies aren't bugs, cockroaches aren't bugs, moths aren't bugs, butterflies aren't bugs, but these are bugs. That cicada that Giovanna has is a bug. And here's a picture of what different bugs look like. Bugs are a specific type of insect. It's a special group. Unlike many other insects, they don't make um, pupae. When they develop, that's something we're going to learn about on Thursday. They have two pairs of wings, but the wings make an X shape. That's the easiest way to figure out if something's a bug. You see these Xs? And then Giovanna, will you hold up your cicada and show us the X in the back? If you see this X, yep, perfect. You see that X shape on the back of Giovanna's cicada? That means she has a bug. So that's a bug. A bug is a specific type of insect. They kind of look like beetles but they have this like X shape on their back. And that's what a bug is. Okay, now we're gonna move on to our main activity for today. We're gonna build our very own insect. Yay, everybody get excited. So now that we know the difference between bugs and insects, we're gonna build our very own insect. Bye. <laughs> so we're all gonna right, grab so our Ziploc bag again, and we're gonna get out our Play-Dohs. You get out both Play-Dohs, and you're also going to get out this piece of shape, this piece of, piece of paper, sorry, this piece of paper that looks like it has a bug on it. Mm -hmm. um, not a bug, an insect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I almost opened that trap. Now that I know what a bug is, I will not say bug. All right, so we're going to take one color of our Play-Doh and separate into three balls. And we're going to take those and put them right on our piece of paper. Right over the three body parts we just learned about. One in the head, one in the thorax, and then one in the abdomen. And now we've got a great start to our insect. It's got three body parts. So we make three balls? 
Yep, make three balls and then put them on your paper at the three parts. Yeah, Miss Murphy Valencia is a great example. Okay, and then after that, you're going to separate your other Play-Doh into 12 pieces. You're going to roll them up into 12 little pieces, and you're going to use those to make your legs, your antennae, and your compound eyes. So here is an example right here of what it's going to look like as you're going. There's me rolling up my 12 pieces, and then I'm going to use them for my antennae, my legs, my wings, and my compound eyes. Jasseline, that looks excellent. Everyone can look at Jasseline's. That looks great. Wow, really good job. Oh, Allison's is great. Great job. Yeah, you made your own insect. And you did the four wings. That's perfect. All right, everyone. So you can keep working on those and finish them up as we're finishing up. Wonder Kids, I think we are ready to meet this week's very, very special guest. Dr. Austin Baker is an insect expert who works at a really cool place called the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles. It's like a museum, but for all things natural. He's super excited to tell us about his job, which is all about insects. Insects are amazing creatures, and there are so many different kinds in California. So Austin's job is to find and study all these insects to learn which ones might need our help because a lot of insects are having a really hard time with climate change. This helps us make smart choices to keep insects safe and happy right in our state of California. So everyone give a really warm welcome and hello to Mr. Baker. Hello, Mr. Baker. Thank you for that introduction, Mr. Lynn. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you all about insects today. So let me share with you sort of my own journey of discovering insects and figuring out that they're super cool. So I am collecting insects across California currently, and California is a big state with a lot of insect diversity. But before I get into that, I wanna introduce you all to who I am. So my name is Dr. Austin Baker. You can call me Mr. Baker. I've been studying insects for over 10 years. Um, I got my PhD from University of California, Riverside, which is not too far from Los Angeles. It's about an hour away. Um, I now work in the entomology collection at the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles. Um, and my goal here is to DNA barcode all of the insect species of California, which we'll talk about. Um, but first, I think the best way to start this story is by talking about my favorite insect. Um, this is the group called the parasitoid wasps. So when I say the word wasp, most people tend to think of something big and yellow and it builds nests and it can sting you if you get close. But most wasps aren't actually like that. So you can ignore this one in the top left here. This is not the type of wasp I'm talking about. Parasitoid wasps are usually really small. I mean like really itty bitty where you need a microscope to even see them. But when you look at them under a scope, they're beautiful. They're incredibly diverse. Um, what makes them a parasitoid is that they are sort of like a parasite in that they lay their eggs on another insect. Those eggs will hatch, and then they eat that other insect while living on them. So you can think of a parasitoid wasp as a type of parasite when it's in its larval stage. When it's an adult, it's no longer a parasite. So let me talk about my favorite one of these, which is the wasp called Orisema. I spent a long time studying this wasp, and I think they're really fascinating. They're really beautiful. Uh, they live with ants, so it's a very unusual place for a wasp to live. So this is a picture, this uh, blue wasp here living among the ant nest. Um, they have a bunch of different ant hosts, so you can see them on things like big-headed ants, um, fire ants, and crazy ants. Oh, this thing is advancing without me, okay. Um, all of these ants are really pretty small, and so the wasp has to be really small too to be able to feed on these ants. So let's start the life cycle with the adult. The adult wasp uh, lays its eggs, I'm sorry, for some reason these slides keep advancing, um, lays its eggs 
inside plants. So unlike most other parasitoid wasps, these ones don't lay their eggs directly on the host. They use their ovipositor, which is like a little stinger, but it's used for laying eggs. And they build this cavity inside the plant tissue. Each time they do this, they leave a single egg behind. So when you look at plants out in the desert or in other places, like this plant here, um, you can see in the red circles, these are lines of ova positions where the wasp has laid a single egg in each of those holes. Um, what I'm showing here, oops, sorry, in the yellow circle is called an extra floral nectary. This is a part of a plant that produces nectar. It's not a flower, but it uh, produces this sweet, sugary substance that insects like to go and feed on. So when the egg hatches and the little larva makes its way out, they usually uh, kind of find these extra floral nectaries and like to hang out there. This is what the larvae look like. They're very unusual when you compare them to other larvae um, because they have this really like strongly plated structure. They almost look like little armadillos or like a little turtle or something like that. They have all of these crazy spines and all of these plates. And if we look at an extra floral nectary up close, if it's full of these larvae, this is what it looks like. It's like a little jacuzzi with a bunch of little worms in it. Um, but these things like to hang out there because insects will come and feed on the nectar that's produced in these structures. So these aren't ants. These are not what these uh, larvae actually parasitize. This is a little insect called a thrips, but it'll come to those nectaries. It'll pick up the larvae then an ant will come and pick up the thrips and take it down into the nest to feed to the ant larvae. The little wasp then jumps onto the ant larvae, and that's who it's actually going to feed on. So you can see um, this little arrow here, this little black dot, that's actually one of the insect larvae. Um, sorry, one of the, the wasp larvae feeding on an ant larva. And then once it's fed for a while, it expands. So you can see now there's all this white space in between. Um, the wasp larvae has begun to actually grow. And when the ant pupates, so this is an ant pupae right here, the wasp larva gets really big and finishes its development. And the wasp itself pupates inside the ant nest among all the ants. The ants don't seem to notice that this thing that just ate one of them is just living right there with them. So uh, they're really well disguised. And then eventually they'll just make their way outside the nest. Um, just undisturbed by the ants. They just crawl right away and then they start the life cycle over again. So it's kind of a complex story, um, but I think it's really cool because there's all these different stages of its life that are completely different. So if we review this one more time, we can see the adult wasp lays its eggs inside the plants. The eggs hatch into larvae, which then make their way to these extra floral nectaries where little insects will pick them up. And then the ants pick up those little insects. They take them down into the ant nest where the parasitoid larva then feeds on all the ants until it gets big enough that it turns into an adult and it leaves the ant nest and it starts it all again. So I find that really fascinating that one little organism can have so many different stages to its life and change so many different times. One of the other cool things about studying these wasps is that I've got to travel all over the world looking for them. So this map is just a few of the places I've gone specifically looking for this wasp. Um, and I've covered the Western United States. I've been to Costa Rica, Trinidad. They're found all over North and South America, um, but they're really rare and they're really hard to find. So I have to go out to these places two or three weeks at a time and search through all the plants, go in, search through all the dirt, live out of a tent for a while. It's, it's really fun, but it's a lot of really hard work. So that's sort of all of that experience I got studying this wasp, traveling around, collecting it, has sort of led me to this next stage in my career, which is working at the Natural History Museum. Uh, the project I'm currently working on is to collect a bunch of different insects because they're so diverse. But how diverse, you might ask? Well, Compared to all of the other animals on the planet, we're talking about mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, all of those combined don't have as many species as insects alone. Insects have millions of species and most of them we don't even have names for yet. 
So that's really exciting. As a biologist, I can go out and discover something brand new that nobody's ever looked at before. And oftentimes they're beautiful. I mean, I work on these little wasps like this, um, but you might have something that looks like one species and has been called one species for 50 years. And as soon as you start looking at it more closely, you realize, no, this is a whole bunch of species. They're all different and they all do slightly different things. Also, insects make up more matter than anything else, any other group of animals on the planet. So imagine that you've got a big old bucket and you put all the insects in the world into that bucket. And you have another bucket that you put all the fish into and another bucket that you put all of the birds into. The insect bucket is gonna weigh more than all of those other buckets. There's just more insects out there. There's so, there's so many of them that they are the most important group of animals on the planet for our ecosystems. So how do we understand this amazing amount of diversity? There's just so much out there. How do we keep track of it all? Well, up to this point, we haven't, we've done a good job of collecting it, but we don't really know what's in the state of California in terms of the number of species. So my goal is to go and collect all of these insect species across the entire state, and then I take a little bit of DNA out of them. And that DNA segment is what we call the DNA barcode. We can use that to identify all of the different species. Um, by doing these collections, we can track over time whether species are no longer in certain areas, whether they're being affected by climate change, whether they are um, spreading to new areas. All of these things are important to understand for a healthy ecosystem. So that's what we're hoping to get out of doing this big insect DNA barcode project. But let's think about what this DNA barcode thing is for a while. What does it mean to have a DNA barcode? Well, I'm sure most of you have been to a grocery store and used the little scanner that tells you what item you're putting into your basket. That's a barcode. It actually reads a bunch of numbers and it tells you exactly what that item is based on those numbers. This works the exact same way, except what we're doing is we're reading a sequence of DNA. And that sequence of DNA will tell us exactly what species it actually came from. So we can do this with millions of insects really quickly and get an idea of how much diversity there actually is in terms of the numbers of species. So we've been collecting across California for the past two years now. Um, we do a number of different things when we're out in the field. We like to take nets and actually sweep them through vegetation and look for insects that way. Sometimes we set out what are called malaise traps, which is this tent looking structure here. This trap we can just leave out for a year basically, and it just keeps collecting insects because they don't see it. They'll fly right into the mesh, and then their instinct when they come into an obstacle is to fly up and over it. But instead, when they fly up, they'll eventually find their way into a bottle and that's how we collect them. And that's how we can figure out what's in the area over a long period of time. With all of these insects we're collecting, we're generating a ton of data records. So each insect now has a picture, it's got a DNA barcode, it's got all of the information that we need to build up this huge library of insect records that we can use to understand what's actually out there. And we want to do this because it's important for us to protect the insects. You know, we might not like every insect out there. In fact, we might think a bunch of them are kind of gross, but really they're important. Regardless how we think of them, they provide important ecosystem services. So when I say that, I mean they pollinate flowers so that flowers can produce more flowers. That's how they reproduce. They uh, break up things like um, dung and other decaying things that we don't want laying around. Uh, they're important to most food webs. And there's a bunch of species that are important for farmers. Uh, they're important medically. So insects are an incredibly important group to their environment and to us as humans. Not only that, there's so many of them, we can use them to estimate the diversity of everything else in the area. So what we want to do is figure out what the diversity of the insects is so that we can figure out how diverse and complex environments are. And that's what we're hoping to do with this project. 
So I think now it's time for us to take a little tour of the collection. And I would have loved to present to you from the collection itself, but uh, the internet's not great there. So instead I took a video this morning that I can share with you all. So before I play that, let's just imagine we're walking up the steps into the museum. We've got to go past all of the dinosaur bones. We make our way down to the big dinosaur hall, go up to the third floor, which is normally off limits. And then we open the doors into the insect collection. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Insight Collection here at the Los Angeles Natural History Museum. Sorry, is that playing? Um, as yeah. you can see behind okay, me, good. we have a lot of rows of insect specimens. Um, because this way, you can see there are rows as far down as you can see, and they're all compacted together. This way, we can fit as many specimens as we possibly can in the smallest amount of space. If you follow me down these rows, you can see. Each wall is filled with drawers, and each of these drawers has well, can have a whole bunch of specimens. So this drawer, for example, has a whole bunch of little tiny flies in it. So small you probably can't see very well from the video, but uh, flies of this size are about the it's about the same size as the wasps I work on, and they're one of the main groups that we work on here for research purposes. Um, if we keep going down a little bit further, we can see some larger specimens. So our collection has holdings from across the world. Um, some of the really cool things we have are like these giant wow. insects. So you can see one of the world's largest ants next to one of the world's smallest ants. Um, you can also see the world's smallest butterfly next to one of the world's largest butterflies. So we have a lot of really cool, fun specimens here in the collection. Um, here are some exotic beetles, for example. These are not from California. These are mostly from the tropics. They've been collected from a long time ago from a bunch of different trips that have been taken from this museum. We have a lot of cool moths and butterflies. These are all real color. None of this is fake. Um, butterflies produce a huge diversity of beautiful colors, often these iridescent, shiny, sort of metallic colors. The other cool things we have here are a bunch of stick insects. So stick insects are among the longest insects um, of, of all of the insects. And they come with a bunch of different sizes and shapes. Some are spiny, some are really thin, some are pink. So this one in the collection. So this is a bunch of specimens that were collected at the La Brea Tar Pits. So these are all local species that you might see around here. Um, you can imagine these are just a few drawers that I'm showing, but in this collection, there are thousands and thousands of drawers full of insects just like this. Walk down this way, you can see just how many rows we have in all of these compactors. Uh, there's one row open right now, so let's uh, explore what's down here. There's some other cool drawers here. So this drawer has a bunch of camouflaged insects in it. You can see some are walking sticks. Some look like dried leaves, like this moth here. Um, some of them look like bark or um, sort of decaying leaves. There's a large diversity of different camouflaged insects which can make them pretty hard to spot when you're not collecting them. We also have a small folding of arachnids. So some of these drawers have tarantulas in them, for example. So here you can see some different tarantula molds. Um, so these are actually the skins left behind after a tarantula sheds its skin. Tarantula here. 
you then have the top popped off so you can actually see what the inside of the tarantula's carapace looks like. All right, here we have a drawer full of scarabs. So scarabs are beetles. Oftentimes they're dung beetles. Sometimes they feed on pollen and flowers, but they're a very diverse group and we've got a nice quality of them. We also have a diversity of robber flies. So this group are called the bacillus or robber flies. They are predators. They'll go around and eat other flies and bees and things like that. We have some pretty grasshoppers here. So most people don't see grasshoppers with their wings spread. You can see they actually have really beautiful colors on their hind wings. Specimens, some various beetles and butterflies. And so all of the specimens in our collection have data with them, which tells us when they were collected, uh, where they were collected, how they were collected. All of this data can be super useful for doing research, um, figuring out what areas have different amounts of biodiversity, uh, which groups live in which kinds of habitats, things like that. So our collection is not only for display, it is also for doing research. You can tell all of your caretakers that it's free to go to the Natural History Museum after 3 p.m. So you can go any day after 3 p.m. because you're an L.A. resident and you can go for free and you can see dinosaur bones and you can see different mammals. But then you can also see cool insects like sp and, and um, other arthropods like spiders. How long did, you take, did it take you to collect all those bugs? <laughs> I did not collect all those bugs by myself. Um, so the bugs that fill all of those drawers in the museum have been collected for over 70 or 80 years now by a bunch of different people. And we also take some of our collection sometimes and trade it with other collections from other places to diversify our collection. So it's, it's a, a lot of people put a lot of work into this. And I've collected a lot, but my contribution to the collection is still relatively small compared to some people that have been around for 30 and 40 years. That's cool. That shows us kind of what we've been talking about all year, right? That scientists work together. We work in groups and we help one another out. We don't have to work all by ourselves. We can work with a whole big team. That is so cool. Well, great questions, everyone. Can we give a big round of applause for Mr. Baker? That was so awesome. And it introduced us to some really important topics too. He talked a lot about pupa and adults and eggs. And we're going to learn even more about that today as we learn about the insect life cycle. Okay, so this thing called the insect life cycle, it's insects, so we're talking about insects, life, because we're talking about their life and being born, them dying, and then cycle, because we're going to see that it's, it's very circular, like a circle. It's a magical transformation story. So insects start out as one thing, but as most insects grow, they change into completely different forms. Think about what happens when you grow. Think about what you look like as you were a baby. You just kind of got bigger, right? You look a little bit different, but you don't look completely different. Now for lots of insects, they actually completely transform throughout these different stages. And it's a cycle because it doesn't end. The cycle starts and ends over and over again. Wow, that's so amazing. All right, everybody. Can you guess what is the first part of the insect cycle? Where do all insects come from? Luca? An egg. Yeah. Oh, all insects come from these tiny little eggs where they hatch from. Now we have to move on with the next set of the cycle with Mr. Lingen. Yeah, that was such a great guess. They all start as eggs. The next step for lots of insects is called a larva. So we saw some larvas in Mr. Baker's presentation. We saw those ant larvas. They looked kind of like little worms, didn't they? They looked really different from an ant. So different insects have different names for a larva. For the name of a butterfly larva, we call it a caterpillar. The next part of the life cycle is pupa. And yeah. different insects have different names for pupa. For example... 
What is a butterfly or a moth pupa called? Chrysalis. <laughs> yes, a chrysalis. Great job. Let's go. That's yeah. a hard word. That's a hard word. That was the very impressive. A cocoon. Yeah, yeah that... a chrysalis or a cocoon is what a butterfly or moth pupa is called. You guys are doing so amazing. Let's move on to the next part and find out what insect is this. All right, are you all ready? Are you looking at these pictures and taking a guess? Ariana and Zelda made their hypothesis. It was a lady beetle. Or as some people call it, a lady bug, even though it's not really a bug. So you were right, Ariana and Zelda. It is a beetle. But I want you to look at how different they look. This larva looks completely different than this adult. It really transformed. Imagine if us humans looked this different between our different times of our life. It would be very different life cycles. And now, because it's a cycle, it's going to start all over again. So this adult lady beetle is going to oviposit these eggs. And then the eggs are going to turn into a larva. And then the larva is going to go into a pupa. And then that's going to go into an adult. And it's going to repeat again and again and again and again and again. And the life cycle will continue. Yay! All right, you guys did so amazing with the insect the insect cycles. So now we're going to make our very own insect life cycle with Mr. Lingen. Okay, Wonder Kids. So let's build our own insect life cycle. So take out your entomology bags. And then there's a plate inside of your bag right here. So this plate has some things written on it. Uh, one of them has an has his egg. It's got a leaf. Um, so just like Mr. Baker showed with his parasitoid wasps, you can oviposit eggs right onto this leaf. The next one says larva and has a leaf again, but as a food source. Some of them, like mine, are whole. Some of yours already have some bites chomped out of them because larvae have already started chomping at your leaves. The next one down here, because we're going in a circle, it says pupa. So this is like that cocoon, chrysalis. And then last one is adult. So we're gonna take our plates and we're gonna put them down flat. So put them down on a flat surface. And then you're gonna take out this little baggie of pasta and dump your pasta out on your flat plate. Okay, so which one do you think are the eggs out of your pasta? Allison? Um, the ones that I think that are the eggs are these, like, these little circle plates. Things. Perfect, yeah, these tiny little white circles. And they actually do look really similar to inside eggs. So now you're going to move those until they're right on your leaf or the ground if you don't have a leaf. And your insect is going to oviposit them right there. Ms. Morphine Valencia is using Play-Doh even so that her sticks right on there. A lot of larvae look like little worms. So it's the little twisty worms. Some are black, some are orange like mine. And those are going to go right on your leaf or right on the ground depending on what your insect is eating. Okay, next we have the pupa. Which one do you think that is? Yep, Elle's got it right. Here's the pupa. It's got a kind of like a hard shell on it, like a cocoon or chrysalis. That's pretty common that it would have a hard shell um, so that on the inside, this metamorphosis, this dramatic change can happen. And then so last one is going to be this, the adult. And why do you think this adult is shaped like this? What do you think these parts are? Is it a life cycle of a butterfly? Yeah, exactly. These are like wings. It's like a butterfly or a moth. Because remember, not all insects have wings, but a lot of them do. And when they do, it's the adults that have them. So we have our adult here with the wings. So when you put it all together, you're going to have an insect lifestyle that looks like this. We have the eggs, the larva, the pupa, and the adult. And you can even do, um, you can even take your adult insect from Tuesday and put it on as the adult instead. And then all of a sudden you have the life cycle of your in own insect. Oh, great job, Allison. I love that. Allison has her life cycle of her cricket. And we can see that's perfect. We can see that it's life cycle right there. That's excellent. Oh, Giovanna's is great too. Oh, these are excellent. 
Okay, so this is your special gift. So you can take anything and put it in it. I'm gonna put one of my pastas in it and put on the cap and look inside. And all of a sudden you have a little magnifying glass, kind of like a mini version of those stereoscopes that Mr. Baker has in his labs. And so with this, this is, a, this is a, something you get to keep as a prize for being a wonder kid to start exploring. You can go with an adult and ask them if you can pick up an insect. And if you can, you can put it in this container and look at it up close. You can put in leaves, you can put in dirt, you can put in insects with adult supervision, and you get to take this home and do whatever you want with it to start your studies. And you are gonna put what we learned to the test. We learned about the life cycle of insects. You could find eggs, you could find larvae, you could find pupa and put them in your containers and learn about them and observe them like a real wonder kid scientist. Yeah, Elle has hers in there, that looks great. It's zoomed in. Okay, we also learned what a real life entomologist is. Uh, we learned from Mr. Baker what the life of an entomologist looks like. And you have your gift so that you get to go and be a real life entomologist and start to put this all to the test. All right, guys, you did so amazing today. We're gonna have a drawing activity. You guys have three minutes to use all the knowledge you learned throughout the week to draw an entomologist together all the pieces of you learn and all the pieces that Mr. Baker has taught you too. Great job everyone. So take out your crayons, take out a piece of paper, put away your cool little magnifying glass for now. But after this, it's yours to keep forever. You can use it again and again and again. So I'm gonna put this three minute timer on, get your crayons out, get your paper out, and we are gonna start drawing an entomologist in three, two, one. You ready, Allison? This is not ready. Allison, you don't need the full three minutes. I bet you know what an entomologist is really well. I bet everybody here knows exactly what an entomologist is now. It's so amazing today. I think you're right. Juan, do you have a question? Oopsie Daisy, I forgot to turn that off. No, that's fine, don't worry. If you want to, you could even integrate your pasta or your plastic insect into your drawing. insect you have seen so far oh that's hard to say i've seen so many um you know i'm biased because i love the little tiny parasitoid wasps and i've seen a huge diversity of those but one of the coolest things i've seen was sort of on the other end of the scale it was a wasp that was about this long it was in texas they call them cicada killers and i chased that thing for about two hours trying to get it in my net Wow. Well, it, was a, it was a fun little <laughs> collection of it. <laughs> that's a oh, cool that's story. That's very scary. I wouldn't be able to sleep at night knowing I'm just a monster. Yeah, it was pretty scary. I've also collected walking sticks in Costa Rica and gotten them in my net and not known it because they blend in so well. And I have my head in the net. And it crawls up onto my face before I realized, oh, it's <laughs> a bug, not an actual stick. Well, <laughs> that's pretty fun. That's so cool. <laughs> I'm excited to see what you wonder kids find when you're using your brand new little magnifying glasses. You're going to find some really cool insects. Yeah, there's so many bugs. There's daddy long leg spiders, there's ladybugs, beetles. Even mosquitoes. Even insects you might not think look cool, like a mosquito or something, once you look at it up close, you see it's really beautiful. They have little feathery wings. They're very cool. Are the 20 more seconds? 30 more seconds, guys. Mosquitoes. Yeah, even flies are very interesting too, right, Mr. Landon? You said they have very composite eyes. So many little eyes inside of their eyes. Yeah, they have cool composite eyes. They have cool different um, shapes and colors all across their body. All right. 
there's time time to hold up your drawings remember if you're not done that is totally fine you can finish afterwards but hold them up remember if you're blurry like mine i'm gonna hold it over the tip of my nose and when I do that and look with my eyes, then it's not as blurry anymore. So everyone hold up your drawings. We're gonna take a picture in three, two, one. Hold them up. Good job, L. Great job. These look excellent. Wow, it is super clear. Oh, I love that. It is super clear that you all know so well what an entomologist does. You learned so much this week. We are going to see you after the weekend. We're going to see you on Halloween. So before you go trick-or-treating, if you're going to, come on by Wonder Kids because we have a lot of fun stuff planned. We are going to be doing cellular biology. And this is the kit you're going to use. Don't open it up gonna, now. I was going to say that we we're going to do circular biology. Oh, yeah. Oh, cellular biology. Great job. And... Don't open it up now because you're not going to have the things for activities, but there might be some candy for you for Halloween. But don't open it up yet. Just come. And we are going to see you on Tuesday. One last time, we're going to give a huge thank you to Mr. Baker for showing us what an entomologist does. Thank and you, you, Mr. Baker. Thank, thank you, Mr. Baker. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Thank Baker. You, Mr. Baker. Thank Gracias. Thank With that, have a great weekend, Wonder Kids. Bye. Have a great weekend, guys. I'll see you next week.